Hi everyone, I hope your summer is off to a great start. We've been just as busy as ever here at SUSE, working on a lot of great new initiatives. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to the June edition of our State of the Consumer series, Who is the Plant-Based Revolution Really For? Plant-based products have become increasingly prominent in recent years. So we set out to uncover who's buying them, where they're shopping, and what drives purchase intent. For anyone who's joining us for the first time, I'm Katie Gross, Chief Customer Officer here at Suzy. And let's start with who is Suzy. We are an end-to-end -end consumer insights platform that combines quant, qual, and high-quality audiences into a single connected research cloud to help companies grow through customer obsession. And the study that we're going to discuss today was conducted on Suzy on June the 9th to 1,000 US-based consumers. It was census-weighted across age, gender, ethnicity, and region. And to kick off today's webinar, I'm going to take us through the results of our consumer survey first. And then a little later in the hour, I'm going to be joined by guest experts to provide their expertise on the subject matter. So stay tuned for Caitlin Stratton, Consumer and Market Insights Senior Manager at Upfield, Phoebe Novak, Product Insights Manager at Impossible Foods, and Eric Pierce, VP of Business Insights at New Hope Network. So everywhere we turn, there is a new plant-based products lining the shelves. The plant-based race is definitely on, and the competition is really heating up. What's particularly interesting here is that when the race first started, we were hearing a lot about startup brands that focus solely on plant products. But lately, however, there's been an increase in food giants like Cargill getting into this race. And unfortunately, that does mean that the race is not without its casualties. We're seeing vegan brands in particular prepare for bankruptcy. So in order to emerge victorious, brands really need to understand who the plant-based consumer is and what their habits are, which is what we aim to solve for today. We're going to be looking into four key questions about this consumer. Who is the plant-based audience? Why are they shopping plant-based? What plant-based products are they buying? And what's influencing their plant-based purchases? So let's jump right into that first question. Who is the plant-based consumer? So according to our data, consumers are eating plant-based items pretty often. 40% of survey respondents identified themselves as plant-based eaters several times a week, while 27% said they eat plant-based items every day. But interestingly, most plant-based purchasers are actually meat eaters too. In fact, 96% are still consuming some form of animal products. So when we break this down even further, what we see is that 75% are omnivores, 13% are pescatarian, 9% are vegetarian, and only 4% are vegan. And what's really interesting about this is that the words plant-based generally have a connotation meaning vegan when it comes to products. But we've learned what we've learned is that the majority of people consuming these products are also eating animal products, from meat to fish to eggs and cheese. And people are choosing plant-based products over others for a variety of reasons, which is what we'll get into a little later in this presentation. I can see some audience questions coming in already, so I'm excited that we're going to be addressing those in the next couple of slides. So one good example here um, is to make sure that we don't assume that plant-based purchasers are not eating meat. They're definitely not just for a vegan audience. And one good example is from Future Farm. They tell consumers that they're not asking them to ditch traditional protein 100% of the time. Instead, they encourage their consumers to make small choices, such as swapping out the occasional meal with their food to create better environmental impact. And since I'm from the UK, I also had to include an example from my homeland. So here we have the Hairy Bikers. They are a chef duo that are known for creating meat recipes. But in this ad, they're saying chicken, You've always been our favorite. But now these veggie stock cubes have come and they've changed the game. And at the bottom of the ad, they say, cheat on meat, which is a direct invitation for their fellow meat eaters to go plant-based, at least some of the time. Which brings us to question two. Why are people shopping plant-based? 
So above all, people that we surveyed are choosing plant-based products for health reasons. But what that doesn't mean is that there's another side to the health benefit story when it comes to plant-based. There are quite a few people out there that question how healthy certain plant-based products really are, particularly those that are meant to taste like meat. So to address that audience question there. What we're seeing is this line of questioning pop up more and more in the media with headlines like, are vegan meat alternatives putting our health on the line? We have to wonder how strong the voice of health dissent is when it comes to plant-based. Well, as it turns out, consumers for the most part still see plant products as the healthier choice to meat products. With 69% of respondents citing that they buy plant-based products for the health benefits. And respondents that share that they perceive plant products to be healthy for a variety of reasons, from lower in fat to less chemicals. And a couple of respondent quotes to include here. Plant-based foods have high protein without having saturated fats. I feel better and have more energy when I include more vegetables or plant-based foods into my diet. And I'm motivated by the simple fact of having a healthier, low-fat diet that's going to help me lose some weight. And 58% of respondents prefer meat alternatives that are designed to mimic real meat. Another key motivator for plant-based purchasing is also sustainability. And it's the number two reason consumers are choosing plant-based products behind health, with 49% of people purchasing these products for sustainability reasons. And what's interesting about the data here is that sustainability is closely intertwined with health for consumers. Some consumer quotes here include, it brings benefits to health and helps the environment and healthy eating has motivated me, as well as wanting to contribute to combating climate change. So it's really the combination of better for you health and better for the planet that makes plant-based choices a no-brainer for people. And what we're hearing people say is things like, I just think it's the right thing to do, it's better for me and it's better for the planet. And the lesson we've learned here is that for consumers, Health and sustainability go hand in hand. And brands should consider positioning their product as a way to kill two birds with one stone, instead of just thinking of health or sustainability as two separate values. An example of a brand that's doing this really well is Corn. Right in their messaging, they promote being both healthy for you and for the planet. So now jumping into question three, which plant-based products are they actually purchasing? The most popular plant-based items are animal product alternatives, with milk alternatives coming in at the number one with 66%, and meat alternatives at number two with 58%. And many consumers are currently finding cow's milk unappealing. What's interesting here is that consumers aren't going off dairy. In fact, we'll get into the polarizing product that is vegan cheese in just a minute. It's truly just cow's milk that many are starting to avoid and find those alternatives for. Looking at some of the data, milk consumption in the United States has actually been declining over several decades. The latest data from the US Department of Agriculture compiled in 2021 shows that the per capita consumption of milk has, is now sorry, about 15.75 gallons per person. And that is down from just over 29 gallons per person back in 1975. Personally, I'm a 2% cow's milk loyalist, uh, but even I have certainly been looking at different flavors to go into coffees to add some variety. And of course, we're all familiar with the most popular milk alternatives by now. Almond is number one, followed by oat and coconut. These are the ones that you can usually find in your local coffee shop when swapping out cow's milk for your lattes. We're also seeing that there are some all, all other alternatives creep up and become much more popular. Cashew milk, hemp milk, and pea milk are all on the rise. I am yet to try and track down pea milk, but I'm excited to try it. I'm a big pea fan. So our lesson for this section is that consumers are willing to embrace new alternatives to the traditional products they're used to. And brands shouldn't be afraid to continue to innovate in the product space. 
and to answer the audience question, I'm putting in facts from across the world. So I'm giving some examples from the UK as well as data that's coming from the UK. But the survey itself was a US based uh, survey. Some of the brands you'll see in here, particularly P um, and potato coming up is going to be uh, going to be uh, US based. So we'll, the lesson for this section really is that consumers are willing to embrace these new alternatives and brands shouldn't be afraid to continue to innovate in the food space. And it looks like how we've figured out how to make milk from just about anything these days. I can actually see soy milk coming up in the audience questions as well. So I'm certainly going to be discussing soy milk coming up shortly. So we have an example here of potato milk becoming the new sustainable dairy alternative. And this correlates directly with our previous lesson about consumers equating health with sustainability. And it also brings up an interesting point, which is that not all milk alternatives are actually sustainable at all, thinking about almond milk, for example. So for our final question today, we're going to look at what's actually influencing that consumer purchase decision. And I don't think it's going to come as a shock to anyone that taste is by far the biggest influence. 65% of consumers said that taste influences their purchase decisions, 59% said ingredients, and 51% cited price as the influencer. So if it doesn't taste good, people won't buy it. We just spent some time talking about how people aren't buying cow's milk anymore, but it does seem that they are still buying cow's cheese predominantly. Vegan cheese has certainly made some improvements over the years, but it's still an area where we found it still striving to taste good for that consumer expectation. And although taste may be the biggest influencer when it comes to plant-based products, the actual bigger barrier is still price. So 54% of consumers said that the worst thing about buying plant-based products is that they're more expensive than their non-plant-based counterparts, which is especially true of milk alternatives which can sometimes cost twice as much as the actual meat products and often cost just as more across the board. And while this has always been a struggle with plant-based products, it's even more prevalent right now, particularly as consumers are really struggling with grocery prices across the board. According to the data, US-based, the average American is currently spending 71% more on their groceries this year compared to this time last year. So when we ask people what they want to see from brands, above all, the consumers said that what they want to see is just plant-based products becoming much more affordable. And this is the number one thing, with 62% of all consumers saying they really want to see this from brands. But that being said, they're also still very interested in exciting new products and more convenient options, with 49% wanting to see brands release new product offerings, 44% wanting brands to make much more convenient, ready to eat options. And really interestingly, brands don't have to be 100% plant based to win over consumers. This goes back to what we were saying at the beginning of the presentation about the fact that most of these consumers aren't vegan. Instead, they're embracing elements of plant based into their diet, but they don't have to buy strictly from vegan brands. In fact, 56% said that they would rather choose a cheaper brand that also sells animal-based products over a more expensive brand that is 100% plant-based in its offerings. Because what it all boils down to is the product itself. And when we ask people to talk about their favorite plant-based products, we heard them talk quite passionately about individual products, but they shared that they didn't necessarily feel a connection with the brand themselves. So we heard things like, I don't have any favorite brands as long as it tastes good. And my favorite is silk almond milk. The extra creamy one is really good, but I feel no connection to the brand as I do to some other brands in different categories. So our final thought starter is that since consumers are still struggling to afford groceries, it makes sense that price is the actual pain point. So how can brands stand out? And it's by making both tasty and convenient new products. And one great example of this is from Wonder Eggs. They are a plant-based eggs that look and feel like the actual thing. You can see right on the packaging here that they're an original product, but also how healthy they are. So 
with that, I'm now going to invite my guests to join us on the camera for today and continue our plant-based chat with the experts. So I'll give it a minute or two for Caitlin, Phoebe, and Eric to join me on the screen. Awesome. I can see everybody. Super excited to have you here. Welcome. So, thank you. Okay. so let's start out by know each other, talking about each other's children <laughs> a little bit better. So if you could start telling us a little bit about yourself, that would be great. Um, and Eric, we'll start with you if you'd like to introduce yourself to the audience. Fabulous. Uh, thanks, Katie. Katie. Um, yeah, nice to be with everyone today. My name is Eric Pierce. I'm Vice President of Business Insights at New Hope and Informa Markets. Um, many of you might recognize New Hope. We are hosts of Natural Products Expos East and West. We also create trade publications and content serving the natural and organic products marketplace. Um, I'm a career market researcher, and I've been uh, studying this space for about nine years now. And um, I lead our internal strategy and research uh, function as as well as our externally focused data and insights businesses, including Nutrition Business Journal and our custom market research services. So nice to be with you guys. Awesome. Welcome, Eric. Phoebe, over to you. Hey, everyone. I'm Phoebe Novak. Um, I'm a product insights manager at Impossible Foods. Um, so if you are familiar with the Impossible Burger, we do everything now from beef, chicken, sausage, pork across the board. Um, as product insights manager, I inform product development. So ranging from decisions where R&D is working on the technical evaluation all the way through commercialization. Um, very excited to be here. Awesome. Caitlin, we'll, we'll finish with you. I'm Caitlin. I'm consumer and market insights for Upfields. We're a plant-based food company. We have brands um, like Country Park Plant Butter and Violet Vegan Cheese. Um, I've been in CPG for my whole career, um, but this is uh, most recently with Upfield in the plant-based food foray. Well, welcome, welcome. So we're going to start with our first question, which is, you know, what are the most common kind of consumer misconceptions that you hear about with plant-based products? And then what do you do to help educate the consumers on that? And Caitlin, why don't you start with you on this one? Sure. Uh, well, so Upfield focuses mostly on dairy, uh, non-dairy or vegan products. Um, it's a common misconception that all plant-based products are non-dairy, um, and that's not always the case. Plant-based uh, can be a confusing labeling landscape. Um, so our products, we try to be very clear about which ones are, in fact, non-dairy. And so we call out, like Country Park Plant Butter, we call out non-dairy on front of pack. Of course, you could also turn it over and look at the ingredients. There's no dairy, there's no whey, there's no casein in there. Um, also, BioLife is a vegan brand, and so we are vegan certified. Um, a vegan would also correspond with completely non-dairy and animal-free. Um, so I think labeling is crucial. It's a newer space. It's uh, Regulations have, have to catch up a little bit, but uh, we try and be as clear as we can on the front pack. Yeah. Makes a lot of sense. And Eric, what about yourself? Yeah, I actually had been debating one one way of answering this question, and uh, Nisha's question in the chat had me thinking a little bit differently uh, about how to answer it. I think actually one of the most interesting misconceptions about the plant-based consumer um, is the stereotype that many of us may have of one another if we're in that space or of that plant-based consumer. And so as we answer the question, who is the plant-based consumer, I think one of the most common misconceptions is that is the typical whole food shopper is the plant-based consumer. The research we've done actually suggests that the plant-based consumer is more diverse than the average U.S. consumer, more likely to be from uh, uh, brown or black populations or ethnic uh, minority groups, um, more likely to be economically diverse than one might expect, um, shopping in both natural and conventional retail channels. Um, and they are also uh, of different education levels and generations. So if we have this perception that this is a Gen Z or Gen X or millennial sort of thing, or that this is only affluent white consumers, you know, who might frequent a Whole Foods, that's actually counter to, to much of what we see is that this is actually Actually, a very diverse audience, um, and so that might be the, the misconception. I would, uh, I would suggest we can all over overlook or or set aside. Yeah, I would definitely. That's that's really interesting to hear. So, new plant based products are popping up all the time. So, what do we think the brands should be thinking about and to make their kind of products much more sticky with consumers? And Caitlin, we'll go back to you for this one. 
Sure. Um, we see that quality and performance are paramount when you're looking for plant-based. Um, a lot of people are changing their habits. And so um, they might try something and you got to love it <laughs> to buy it again. Um, so, I mean, we have great R&D um, at Upfield. Um, we're really proud of everything they've been able to do. But for example, like our country crop plant butter, we made sure it is a complete one-for-one -one swap in terms of performance to butter. Um, because we don't want you to change your cake recipe, but if you want to go plant-based, we want you to be able to enjoy your cake too. Yep, absolutely. And fun fact, I buy country crop plant butter. I didn't realize it was plant-based. It's just a great tasting product. I didn't even think about the fact that it's plant-based. Packaging is fantastic. And uh, <laughs> <It's super healthy. laughs> yeah, we're really proud of that one. Yeah. Eric, what about yourself? What can you share here? Yeah, I think, um, you know, thinking about how to market against all this increasing competition in the marketplace, I, I think historically about what plant-based was and then where the market's at right now is an important thing to think about in terms of how you create that stickiness. Um, go back five, seven, even 10 years ago, and being plant-based was enough to differentiate yourself in the competitive set. But now we've seen so many of the categories begin to be much more competitive where there are multiple brands and multiple products that are trying to fight for uh, the attention of people looking for plant-based. So the recommendations I've got for brands looking to create stickiness is, yeah, absolutely compete on taste, texture, product performance, but also it's time to start thinking about building strong brands with clear positioning statements identity, image, personality, building trust and reliability, um, and positioning yourself as being more than just plant-based. Figure out what your audience really desires and figure out how to communicate that. Differentiating from conventional products, yes, but also against other plant-based products in the marketplace. And uh, we talked last week in another session uh, with Susie here about values-based marketing. That can absolutely be one way of engaging and differentiating a brand that is well-suited to many products in the plant-based space. Um, it could be crowded positioning, but I think the idea is we need to shift from being plant-based as the primary benefit to saying now, how do we compete against the competitive set, which is increasingly plant-based itself as well. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, and V, we'd love to hear from you on this topic also. Yeah, I completely agree with everything that's been said. Um, and I think what's really critical is, as Eric was saying, delivering on that clear value proposition, but just making sure consumers don't have to sacrifice. So as, as much as you can get your products to be very similar to the animal on texture, very similar to the animal on taste, at Impossible Foods, we have an excellent R&D team as well. Um, and they do a really good job at doing that so that consumers aren't feeling like they're giving up um, their sensory experience, basically, as they're choosing to switch to plant-based for other reasons like the environment um, or ones that were mentioned before. Yeah, that's awesome. So we saw in the, the survey results that health was a common driver um, amongst the respondents. And another key factor in plant products was the environmental impact. So how do you convey that sustainability message of your product? And Caitlin, we'll go back to you. And how do you recommend that other brands do it? Yeah, the huge benefit of plant-based eating and plant-based products is the impact they have on the environment compared to their uh, animal-based uh, equivalents. Um, we, do, we do know that for many consumers, though, it is a nice to have. Um, so it's not typically the first message we put on front of pack. It's not typically um, something we kind of lean in strong as our first reason to uh, make the switch. Um, but uh, we do have all that information available on back of pack and on websites um, when we can speak more in um, like our trade show forum, we can talk to more of the sustainability benefits. I know at Upfield, we're really big on doing these life cycle uh, assessments with a third party where we look at our entire supply chain and the impact of the environment in producing plant-based products. And all of that information is available on our website. And so for, consumer, for really engaged consumers and shoppers, um, it, you, can, you can dive in pretty deep, which is exciting for someone like me who loves data. Yeah, that's awesome. And maybe we'd love to hear from you on this one as well. Um, yeah, we found similar findings and I'll, I'll add some builds. So definitely in the U.S., sustainability is a, a nice to have. Consumers are going to choose based on taste, based on price, based on other factors. But when you go into different markets, you want to be careful that you're actually doing research to know what's motivating in that market. So, for example, like we found in Europe, sustainability is actually a much bigger motivator 
um, than what we see in the US. And then you could maybe think about how to tailor your products and messaging accordingly. Um, and we've also found too, that when you are communicating sustainability benefits, um, the most motivating way to do that is actually to use numeric comparisons to the alternative. So we also use life cycle assessments so that we can get statistics like Impossible Foods uses 80 to 90% less lands, water, greenhouse gases than animal beef. And we found that really that uh, percentage comparison is much more motivating than using generic statements about sustainability um, or kind of broader statements away from what your each consumer is doing with each specific product. Yeah, that's awesome. So our data showed that a lot of plant-based consumers are omnivores and hands up there, I love meat, but I also really want to eat a lot more plant-based products myself. So with plant-based consumers being omnivores, was this surprising to you, Caitlin? No, we see it a lot. I think most consumers are on a journey. And so you might have Meatless Monday, but then you might have pepperoni pizza uh, for Friday night dinner. Um, so not everyone's plant-based all the time for all meals. Um, and I think that's why that percentage comes out so high. Um, but we love everyone on any part of the journey. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's great. And actually, a great, great question that came in from Nisha there. Do they identify as omnivores or flexitarians? Well, we actually found is they identify as omnivores. We'll send you the deck later, um, but one of the stats had mentioned, I'm trying to think of the number exactly, but it was only 13% flexitarians. I think it's something like 40% omnivores. Um, yeah, I don't even necessarily brand myself a flexitarian, but definitely definitely eat both. And meatless Mondays, meatless Tuesdays is definitely a thing in my in my house. Eric, what about yourself? Um, were you kind of surprised to hear how, how many omnivores are eating plant-based? No, I think uh, for, for a while now, the, the really exciting opportunity has been to sell to that broader audience. And um, and it is, it's it's tricky though to think about it. We actually have numbers um, that very closely match yours, Katie. Um, very few consumers really do identify uh, as vegan or vegetarian or even flexitarian. I think it was 13% that we found as well in another survey, 4% vegan corroborates what you guys had, 8% vegetarian, 13% flexitarian or plant-based. Um, but 44%, you know, say they perf they eat alternative meats from time to time. 41% say they choose non-dairy products or prefer non-dairy products over dairy products. Um, I think that's, sorry, dairy milk specifically in this instance. Um, so as you're thinking about marketing to this audience, I think it's important to remember that they don't necessarily identify as plant-based. What they're identifying with is the mix of health, climate, animal, social, or clean label issues that resonate with them. Um, one of the things that we often encourage people to remember is that the plant-based consumer tends to be a more conscious, aware, thoughtful consumer who has found their way to plant-based through one or several of these things. And those are their reasons for buying, not so much because of their identity with an in-group, if the in-group is vegan, vegetarian, or flexitarian. And so uh, it's it's key to, unless you're targeting vegan, there's a there's a viable business for, for many to say, no, we're by vegans, for vegans, and that's our core audience, and we'll take other consumers as well. And then there's opportunities for brands that are like, no, we're for the omnivore, and we don't need to position as vegan. Uh, but it's important to remember that not everyone identifies that way. And if you're looking for that more conventional shopper or that mass audience that that they probably don't identify with with these terms that we're using. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, even just thinking, you know, personally, I will drink coconut milk mocha, um, but I'll always drink cow's milk and tea. So it's even just, it's coming back to the taste thing that we, we heard so frequently in the survey itself. So do you frame your product messaging around different consumer profiles? Like what's the messaging for meat eaters, vegans, et cetera? Or is it possible to really have a kind of one size fits all approach to your messaging and plant-based? Caitlin, would love to kind of hear from you on this topic. Yeah, we identified three common sort of motivators to go plant-based. Um, and I think that's universal in at least our findings across consumers, different parts of the journey or different groups, omnivores or vegans alike. Um, and it's really taste, health and the planet. Um, but where we find the big differences is that prioritization of those three is very different based on your position, either if you're an omnivore or a vegan. Um, and so that's how we tailor our messages. We actually sort of have messages against those two, those three themes, but, um, when talking to a, a vegan consumer, we might get more into the benefits of the planet um, because they might have different taste expectations. 
it's not really motivating. Say, tastes like cheese. And they're like, well, I don't need dairy <laughs> cheese. <laughs> I just want it to taste good. Um, so I think there's common themes, but it's about uh, how you engage in the conversation it might look a little different. Yeah, sure. So how do you use research to identify that kind of what seems, seems like a fluid core consumer? And Caitlin, we'll go back to you on that one as well. Yeah, we do a lot of research, um, quite a bit on the Ask Suzy platform. Um, what's great about the Ask Suzy platform is it lets us survey and re-survey and talk to uh, different consumers. So I mean, we do a lot of surveys. We also go into people's homes and talk to them. Most recently, we went and looked in people's refrigerators who were buying um, plant-based products as well as dairy-based products. And we just talked to them about why do you have this one? When do you use this one? Um, and that's really, really, really interesting. Yeah, that's awesome. And Phoebe, what about yourself? Um, yeah, for product messaging, I agree with Caitlin that we found kind of similar themes to like taste, nutrition, planet. Um, and the other lens that we take is we want to make sure we're understanding the consumer of the specific product type. So like the chicken nugget consumer might look very different from the ground sausage consumer. And then their motivations for why they would choose a plant-based chicken nugget can sometimes be very different than why you're choosing maybe plant-based ground sausage or plant-based ground beef. So making sure that you have that additional lens on top of um, those three kind of major themes that we see. And for us, we use research um, similar. We use surveys, focus groups, other tools. We found that a really good foundational kind of attitude-based consumer segmentation has been very, very helpful for us. Um, and we want to make sure we are also kind of connecting that to maybe some retail shopper analysis. So you can link those kind of profiles, attitudes to what consumers are actually doing in the grocery store um, and understand the link between those two. Yeah, yeah, that's so key. Um, and obviously, speaking of that exact topic, so we know that shelf space in grocery stores is key and category management in this kind of area has been vital, um, but it's kind of fluid. So what are your thoughts on integrating plant-based products into the general aisle? Is it plant butters with other butter, et cetera? Or is there a specific section for putting all of the plant-based products together on the shelf? Caitlin would love to know this, particularly as I picked up your products just because it was next to the butter. I didn't even know it was plant-based. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I have a very strong point of view. And I think we at Upfield have a very strong point of view is I think it's uh, plant-based products should be right next to their animal-based counterparts. Um, what we see is just majority of consumers are switching between the two, the two types of products. And so the shopping experience for them is most easy and convenient when they're next to each other. And so if you think about um, right now, our plant butter is with the dairy butter. Um, Plant-based milks are right next to the dairy milks. For cheese, for example, we're not quite there yet. Um, but when you shop milk, you walk into the store and you say, do I want a plant-based or a or animal-based milk today? And then if you want plant-based, do I want oat or almond? And so I think it makes, shelving them together makes uh, it a more natural shopping experience. Yeah, it's like a milk destination for sure. Eric, what are your thoughts on this topic? Yeah, I, I agree. And um, I the only thing that I would add to what Caitlin has says, is said is that I think it probably depends on product positioning and category, right? If you're that vegan product for vegan consumers, you might want to cater to their desire to not enter the meat section, right? If you would, and, and if that's your product type. But if you're targeting the the, the more mainstream consumer and, and where the largest volume of dollar potential is, then you probably want to be in line assuming your category has begun to change that behavior and that there are enough competitors or enough products to support that. I do think that there are some categories that will benefit from being clumped together in a plant-based section um, as they begin to continue to grow and gain some amount of traction. Um, and I think that's what we're seeing with some of the cheeses as an example right now. I think that's what we're seeing in the, in the frozen case. We tend to have all the plant-based frozen items still together. And so as those categories grow and um, get more engagement from consumers, I think they can make the leap. But I don't know that there's a, a single answer that crosses all categories at this point. Yeah, you raise a really good point that I didn't even think of is that vegans may not even want to walk down those aisles. So it's a really good point to be, to be really mindful of the different types of consumers. So how do you put taste at the forefront of the product messaging, given we heard uh, you know, how important it is to consumers? 
So Caitlin would love to know how you're how you're thinking about that in that field. Yeah, we are packaging all the time. We have beautiful food imagery shots on our packaging, on our digital social communications, um, because appetite appeal <laughs> works. Um, and you get to uh, showcase some of the functionality of the product. Um, we talk a lot about in our company about cheese pulls. So when you think about taking a slice of pizza and that cheese sort of lingers, uh, we <laughs> spend a lot of time talking about that internally. Um, also, we, I love product windows. Um, like Violet, for example, you know, you can see the cheese um, and that's great. Uh, you can see what you're getting. Um, and so those are two things that we leverage a lot that uh, increase appetite appeal. And if you go grocery shopping hungry, <laughs> you end up leaving hungrier. <laughs> oh, for sure. You just said cheese pull and now I want pizza. So <laughs> <laughs> it's so censored. Phoebe, I'd love to hear from you on this topic as well. Yeah, I completely agree. Like, I think showing taste is most important. Um, we know that based on research that 80% of choice at shelf is influenced by visuals rather than text. And consumers are kind of spending like five seconds at the shelf. Um, so making sure that you have those craveable images, whether it's on pack or whether it's also in marketing. Um, so recently Impossible launched a summer grilling campaign um, think about like the Mac versus PC trip, but we did it with two burgers where the PC was like the animal ver burger and the impossible is the Mac. Um, but the photography and the shots was really zoomed in. And so you could really see that like craveable burger. So you're getting all those taste cues without necessarily talking about it. Um, and the other thing I'd say, if you are talking about taste, you want to make sure that it's actually like backed up by claims. So we do a lot of consumer testing to understand the sensory experience of our products so for example, impossible chicken nuggets, we have data to show it tastes like actual chicken in blind taste tests with consumers. So when we launched that product in 2021, we did a series of food trucks in key markets um, and kind of recreated the taste test so consumers could have taste the animal, taste the impossible and pick the one that was their favorite. Yep, definitely. The impossible chicken nuggets are delicious. <laughs> so definitely chicken, chicken nuggets fan. So, Caitlin, Upfield has obviously an interesting brand journey in that you're kind of newer um, than some of the brands in your portfolio. Could you kind of tell us a little bit more about the history of Upfield and uh, a little bit more about that journey? Yeah, so Upfield was divested from Unilever in 2018. Um, so we became a, a smaller company, or a, a smaller Unilever, but we became a, an own independent company um, in 2018, coming from a very big process-oriented, sophisticated company. Um, it, it allowed us to refocus on, on less categories and really that plant-based proposition. Um, also in 2020, we acquired Violife, uh, which is the new and uh, newer vegan cheese brand. Um, so I actually, one of the prop, one of the reasons I'm at Upfields is it's got a great proposition of we have the history systems, the R&D knowledge of a big company um, and a lot of the resource structures of that, uh, relationships with uh, retailers and, and supply chains and things like that. However, we have the mentality of a much smaller, uh, more nimble, more agile company, um, and we can really focus on plant-based. Um, so I love the balance there. I think we've taken the strengths of brands like Country Croc and been able to move them into the plant-based space in maybe a little bit more of a progressive way, um, but still really respecting their history. Um, so it's been a great transition uh, for Upfield, I think, um, and or we're excited to see where we get to go next. Yeah, for sure. And Phoebe, you already touched on food service a little bit here, but obviously knowing that you folks also play in the food service space, It'd be really interesting to hear how do you market your product to consumers versus to restaurants in that kind of food service area yeah definitely in the food service area it's a little bit different because we're essentially like moving through the food service operator to reach consumers um we have very specific guidelines for how we want to show up on menus um, and we work really closely with basically the operators especially if it's a larger operator to make sure that the marketing, the how we're menued, the window claims, everything that we're doing is basically aligned with those brand guidelines. Um, and we also make sure that can, we are basically matching the animal experience for the operators. So we do a lot of testing on like distribution, shelf life, cooking process. It should 
be kind of like one-to-one -one with how the back of house is basically um, kind of working for the animal so it's easier for the operators to do so. And then for consumers, we have all sorts of marketing. We do um, kind of in-store marketing. We do digital online. A lot of it is also just earned media, um, which we get through kind of uh, articles as well. So we have all the different marketing channels. Yeah, that's great. And Caitlin, you're also in the food service space as well. Is that right? How do you market your kind of products differently from consumers to restaurants? Yeah, I think we have a lot of the similar, uh, I guess, nuances or challenges that um, Phoebe's team faces. Um, I will say, um, because the the end consumer, the diner, is also oftentimes the person in the, the um, grocery store, um, we want everyone to have sort of the same experience. And so a lot of the performance and uh, factors and quality are really similar across uh, the products we offer depending on the channels. Um, of course, food service operators um, largely just have have different packaging needs. Um, so mm -hmm. we have the same products in different packages. Um, if anyone wants like a five pound block of butter, <laughs> that is a capability we have, uh, but it's something we sell through our, our food service operators. Um, yeah, but I think it's great when we connect those sides of the businesses because you can learn a lot. Um, you, you, a chef might, uh, use a plant-based butter or plant-based cheese um, in a different, a little bit of a different way, or almost like hack that you can then adapt to uh, a consumer in home or uh, someone just cooking for their family at home. Um, and so we look for those parallels too. Um, yeah, I might buy that amount of butter. Right? <laughs> <laughs> <A little> toast. <laughs> So Eric, to focus on your speciality, it's the nat natural kind of channel shopper. So what are you seeing in that space that might be different from our survey results as it pertains to the natural channel shopper? Yeah, uh, no real differences with the natural channel shopper, actually. Um, what we find very often is the, the natural channel shopper also shops conventional. There are very few who shop exclusively natural. Um, so very often these are, are consumers that are shopping both channels um, with the, the exception of a maybe 5% shop exclusively natural, about 20% shop most, both channels. Um, but, but that consumer shows up uh, everywhere and in both of these channels. And that's an important thing to think about as you think about retail distribution and where you might grow um, and, and get a foothold into the category and then where you might find your scale. Um, and, and so not a big difference there. Um, if I could, I might bring up a response to a conversation that was happening in chat with regards to this audience. It, there was this conversation that came up about um, many consumers desire for health and wellness, which is a common motivator for people who are engaging in this category, but also the natural channel uh, at large. And what some will describe as a paradox of the formulations of, of ingredients that go into these products um, as a what many in the industry are debating, is this a paradox? Is this something consumers don't want? And, and I actually, what I've found in our analysis is, is that, that clean label is something that consumers consider. But for many consumers, of course, there are exceptions where there are certain ingredients that people feel don't work well for them or, or have a, a reaction to. But for many consumers who are engaging in this space, what we actually find is that they manage that apparent paradox with relative ease because these are those more aware conscious consumers who are thinking more about lots of things that go into what they're buying and very often they might see a complex ingredient list and if that was in a conventional product maybe that would be a turnoff for them but if that more complex i'm not saying bad but that more complex ingredient list is presented to them within the context of a product that's better for the planet that doesn't have cholesterol um, that has other benefits actually what we find is consumers are weighing those things in balance fairly dynamically and still making choices to eat these products that in other parts of the natural product space we see clean labels simple ingredient lists recognizable only being something that drives innovation and and i just like to point out that in in this world where consumers are balancing lots of different desires uh, that clean label seems to be less of an issue um, and that consumers are engaging quite um, quite constructively with the, the the benefits that they're getting from these products so yeah that's great you mentioned the chat it's been very active on this call so thank you so much to everybody in the audience for, for, for chatting with us um, so Eric on that kind of topic do you think the plant-based race has become like a little too crowded and is it really is it confusing for consumers do you think 
I ha- I think I think about the marketplace since I'm not a brand uh, working specifically for a brand. I think this competition is just what we need, right? Um, it, it's it's important to remember that for a lot of these products and categories, we're building category by category, subcategory by subcategory formulations that work to mimic very clear expectations consumers have for an existing product, and all of that innovation, all of that effort is going to be. Um, driven by the level of competition that we're seeing in the marketplace. There's unfortunately, there's going to have to be successes and failures as we pursue those product formulations and products that meet consumers demand. Um, so, so from a market perspective, from a how do we scale plant-based overall, I think this is just the sort of competition we need and I wouldn't call it too crowded. If you are hoping for white space opportunity, there's less of that available in plant-based these days, unless you're going to some of the more interesting, less ventured spaces. Um, uh, and so, so yeah, no, I don't think it's too crowded. I think it's just what the category needs overall. Great. So it feels a little bit maybe like we've plateaued in the number of new brands that are coming to the market. Um, maybe not. Um, what advice do you have for brands that are trying to really break into a new market? Yeah, just just to recognize the increased level of competition. Um, I think the other thing for both, there are skeptics who are talking about, oh, plant-based is down, maybe it was just hype. Um, I think it's important to, to take a Gartner hype cycle sort of way of thinking about where plant-based is at right now. There was a lot of hype. Um, that came over the last five years that drove probably unrealistic expectations for investors as well as for consumers. And there was a lot of media attention that that inflated that hype. And the reality is, as, as innovation tends to be, I think we're entering in category by category where we're at on this life cycle is different. But for a lot of categories, we're in that what's called trough of disillusionment, right? Where the hype was a little bit of ahead of the product's ability to perform and deliver on those expectations. And the trough of disillusionment has some brands exiting because they can't innovate to meet performance levels and others kind of just working through the need to be able to innovate and drive sort of that slow progress that gets us back to meeting consumer expectations. So I think we're just, I I wouldn't say we've plateaued. I think we've actually declined a little bit, but I think that's the normal life cycle, not necessarily a reason to believe that, you know, the category is, is over or that it didn't meet customer demand. I think it's just, we're in that lots of hard work needs to be done uh, to meet the needs of consumers category by category, subcategory, a product. I mean, the amount of innovation that's needed to get all of these products to perform as well as, as our, um, as our panelists have done with their products today, it just is going to take time and effort. And that's, that's what we're working through as a, as a category. Yeah, for sure. Um, and on that topic, let's go back to Phoebe. So Impossible is obviously ubiquitous at restaurants and grocery stores these days. Um, so can you talk a little bit more about how you've done that? Like how have you integrated into very traditional kind of meat-centric spaces? Yeah, definitely. Um, anyway, before I answer that question, one build on Eric's point. Um, I also think in addition to kind of brand, you have to look at channel too, because we see like in food service that plant-based sales continue to increase it's more on the retail side that maybe you're seeing that plateau. And then also the performance is very different by brands. So it depends on some brands might be doing better than others. So I think like there's been a lot of negative press, but I think that the picture is like more nuanced than what we're seeing. And it's definitely important to, to be positive as well. Um, uh, for impossible specifically, I think we took a little bit of a more, untraditional approach. So we actually launched in food service first in 2016. Um, We built credibility basically with chefs like David Chang, other influential chefs, and then getting those larger partnerships that everyone's familiar with, like Burger King, like Starbucks. And it wasn't until 2019 that we launched in retail. Um, And that kind of was, I think, good timing for that boost driven by COVID where everyone was grocery shopping in 2020. There's a lot of out of stocks. People are maybe trying things they weren't, wouldn't otherwise. Um, And so now we basically reached um, basically almost all grocery chains in the United States. Um, And so we're kind of everywhere. And I think the way that we've done that at Impossible is a few areas. One is just, we have a really good product. Operators will do market tests. You'll have retailers kind of testing the products internally So showing that we can deliver on that and then also building the trust with consumers, with brands, making sure that kind of they believe in the taste experience of our products. Um, And I touched on a few of these before, just making it easy 
for retailers, operators to kind of integrate our products in as they would the animal. So distribution, shelf life, cook process, everything kind of similar. So they're not building these whole new processes for the plant-based market, partnership support, and then just a data-driven culture. I think our company was very R&D driven originally, and that's permeated throughout the organization. So we have data kind of informing all of our decisions throughout the org, and that's made us very successful. Yeah. Yeah. It's so key. Obviously, the first time I uh, had an Impossible Burger was at Burger King <laughs> um, at a gas station. I think it just made it so accessible that then when I saw it on shelf, I recognized it, um, et cetera. It it's, it's, comes down to the product. It's delicious. So let's focus now kind of on the, like, the next leg of the race and where the future is going to go. So what types of developments do you think we're going to see in this space over the next year and then like over the next five years? And Kate, we'll go back to you to begin. Yeah, the future of plant-based food is so exciting. So uh, I know in the survey, people have been disappointed with cheese in the past, uh, vegan and non-dairy cheeses. This is somewhere where we make progress. It's every day. Um, so if you haven't tried, tried a vegan cheese in the last year or three years, we hear that a lot, tried it and I didn't like it. Try again. Um, the the uh, process, progress here is amazing and outstanding and these products just keep getting better and better and better. Um, and so I think it'll just complete, if you haven't tried something in the last year or two, I think you'll be blown away by what's available now on shelf. Um, I'm also really excited about learning more from the cultivated or cell-based driven um, trend in, in basically replicating dairy proteins um, and uh, meat proteins and things like that with plant-based ingredients. Um, not having a science background, this sort of technology just blows my mind and makes me really excited for the things that can be unlocked for the next five years in plant-based. There are things we probably can't even dream of today that are just gonna be the norm in five years because the technology is just outstanding and always getting better. Yeah, I completely agree. Cell-based like dairy protein technology is fascinating for sure. Um, there was a question from the audience. Is there a vegan cheese brand that you'd recommend that we all try? Obviously, uh, BioLife. <laughs> BioLife uh, is available, uh, actually, uh, or cream cheese is at Walmart, uh, Whole Foods, ShopRite, uh, if you're in the New York, New Jersey area, uh, Kroger. We have a lot of uh, distribution. It's great. A wide variety. You can get mozzarella, your cheddar, Parmesan, feta. Feta is outstanding. Um, I had your guys' Mediterranean grilling cheese last night. Yeah. I was I was impressed. Uh, We'll say halloumi. We have halloumi. Yep. <laughs> the naming things there, but also grilling cheese. Um, cheese is so fun. There's so many different types. Um, we, we're really, really proud of BioLife. Awesome. Well, I cannot wait to try and track that down this weekend. <laughs> it's definitely been a few years. I remember tasting it a couple of years ago. I'm like, mm, not again. I'll stick to the cow, but now I'm going to try it again. So it's definitely up there. Um, What's kind of one development that you maybe kind of personally, uh, you know, hope to see in the next year or five years? And Eric, we'll, we'll go back to you. Uh, yeah, I think um, I think a great place for plant-based products in general to strive towards is to to think about how we can go even further in our environmental commitments in support so in sourcing and supply chains. Um, Many plant-based products are in, inherently more sustainable, and that's amazing and great. And and the food system's going to benefit from, you know, the transition. Maybe it's not going to ever be a hundred percent transition, but transition of some of our agricultural practices towards more plant-based products and formulations. And as we do that, I would just encourage people uh, across the plant-based space. Honestly, this is a burden that anybody in food and beverage should carry. Um, but but I, I want to invite those in the plant-based space as well to, to not just say, yeah, we are inherently more sustainable, but to say, okay, how do we continue to, to formulate with uh, ingredients and supply chains that themselves are also as sustainable as they can be? And so I think that's a great opportunity for us to, to continue to really double down on this commitment to being environmentally uh, more sustainable and, and better for, for people and planet. Yeah, for sure. I know that when we were talking before, you'd mentioned kind of partnerships between AI and R&D teams, maybe? If you could maybe yeah. elaborate on that. Oh, my gosh. Well, 
there are some really interesting things that are beginning to happen um, when when AIs partner with food formulators, and we we are seeing some. If I'm thinking, you know, a few years well, currently, but also a few years out, I think it'll be really interesting to see what when you combine uh, uh, AI suggesting product formulations with food tasters who are feeding information back to the computer that says, yeah, this is pretty cool, this is close, or nah, doesn't really taste quite right. Um, we've seen some really interesting innovations that have driven, um, have raised the bar in terms of taste or texture uh, or cooking performance in some interesting ways. And so I, I expect that in the, in the years ahead, we'll see some, uh, some categories that have been difficult to really replicate um, begin to get easier and easier to, to replicate with plant-based. So that's a, that's a thing yeah. to watch for and or engage with today. Yeah, that's fascinating. So chat GBT, cell-based dairy protein technology converging. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Caitlin, what is kind of one development that you personally hope to see in the next either one or five years? Uh, personally, I... I uh, I'm a big proponent of reducing food waste. Um, so I love seeing brands out there that can help take steps uh, to reduce the, the uh, burden of food waste on our system. Um, there's snacks like from brands like Rind, where you know, you're using the whole fruit. Um, and also just uh, some of our, our products, we are able to leverage regenerative agriculture. Um, for some of our oils and ingredients. And so I can, I'm really excited about brands taking big steps there. Um, my favorite example is how Whole Foods changed like the way that chickens and eggs were um, sort of the, the quality of standard or quality of life for chickens by really putting an emphasis on the, the type of eggs and, and the habitats of the chickens. And so brands, big brands can make a really big difference in supply chains. And that's where I'm personally most excited about um, for plant-based, especially. Yeah, awesome. And Phoebe, what's that kind of one development that you personally hope to see in this space? I think for me, I would love to see kind of reaching price parity with animal. Um, it's still a big barrier for consumers, especially in commodities like meat um, and especially with inflation. Um, so I think the more that we can drive the price down, the, the more choice, the, the, the more we'll kind of reduce those barriers to consumers actually choosing us instead of the animal. Yeah, for sure. And finally, with kind of one to two minutes left to go, obviously we're all consumers. And as you can see from the chat, everyone's super excited to try out a lot of new products. So what, do you, what advice do you have for consumers who are interested in implementing more plant-based products into their daily lives? Kate, we'll start with you. What's the easy way in? As you might know, <laughs> I'm a big fan of Country Crock Plant Butter. The next thing you're going to bake, pick up a pack of Country Crock Plant Butter instead of your traditional dairy butter and make a complete one-for-one -one swap. Do nothing different. And then see if you can tell the difference. Um, I've done it with multiple family and friends. Um, and I have yet to have someone who can tell me which one's a dairy-based and which one's a plant-based cookie or uh, cake. Um, I think the results will just like blow you away. Um, so mm -hmm. do it. I, I put thick, thick layers on my toes and I can't taste the difference at all. So it's <laughs> um, really similarly priced to butter too. So we've actually removed the barrier of price. So just do it. Just do it. <laughs> just do it. Yep. And exactly. message me and how it went. <laughs> <laughs> yep. And finally, we'll end with you, Phoebe. So um, what is that kind of advice for consumers to implement more plant-based products? Yeah, similar. Just like the small moments, right? Like just one plant-based meal a day or a few a week, just like swapping in where you can. I think over time, you have a really big environmental impact. Um, and Impossible has a ton of really great options. We just launched Beef Light, which has better nutritionals than our core. We, we like last week just launched indulgent burger patties where the taste is juicier, beefier than our original. And we have breaded chicken, sausage, beef. It's like pick your favorite animal meat, swap it in for a plant-based meat. Um, and I think just those small moments really add up. Awesome. Well, I'm excited to try all of those products.
And that was absolutely fantastic. Normally we try to take uh, questions from the audience. I know that our panel have been amazing answering a lot of those questions in the chat itself. So that's all the time that we have for today. Huge, huge thank you to the amazing panel of guests and thank you to everyone that joined us in the chat as well. It's been really enlightening for me personally. And I know that the audience will also have gained a huge amount of insight for this increasingly important topic. So I hope to see you all again next month for the next thing of the consumer. Bye folks.